thank you so much for joining us. You've given us such great memories. You know, I, I need to know who your heroes were. Who inspired you growing up to want to pick up the guitar and dedicate your life to this beautiful craft? Well, uh, my sister had a guitar and I didn't when I was eight years old. So that was my main motivation. I was, I was mad I didn't have my own guitar. <laughs> so the next birthday or Christmas, my dad gave me a guitar and I took lessons right away. Um, and at that time, it was the Beatles and the Monkees and pop radio. And yeah. in my teen years, I got into the blues and started buying a lot of B.B. King, John Lee Hooker records and playing along with those in, in my bedroom, closet player for many years. And I eventually discovered Jeff Beck mm. and um, that was it. And that's still it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty magical. That motivated me right there. I want to go in that direction. And I went to Musicians Institute, um, when I, I forget how old, way back a million years ago. Sure. And that, that was the real kick in the pants for... Um, kind of made you dedicate yeah. all areas. Yeah, it took me to a whole other level. A yes. whole other level. You know, I had taken lessons with, with various guitar teachers and music shops for years, and then when I auditioned for Musicians Institute, I flunked the test. Because they had taught me techniques and songs, but never the building blocks, scales, arpeggios. Right. Yeah. So that that was a life changer for me. And uh, I've been fans of all kinds of music since then. Van sure. Halen, George Lynch, Steve Morris, different guitar players. Yes. My dad was a big jazz fan, so I always heard Joe Pass and Jim Hall in the house, Django. <laughs> so I, all that stuff. I was getting in my ears over the years. Sure. And I finally started playing live and evolved and I've had a hell of a lot of fun experiences traveling around the world. Now, how did you come to join the greatest entertainer ever and be a part of Michael Jackson's team and show? Tell us how that happened. Well, I was one of the lucky ones that got to audition. I heard he had a hundred guitar players that he auditioned. And um, one of his guys called Musicians Institute when I was teaching there and said, send us two players. And I was one of the lucky ones that got to audition. So I took a couple days off and really dug in and learned some of his songs. And when I showed up, there was no band. It was just me playing for a video camera. So basically what they said is, you know, he's going to, most of the show is about rhythm playing. So I played some funky rhythm stuff. And then I started soloing, just improvising, and then I played um, Giant Steps solo, John Coltrane's Giant Steps. I had worked out a tapping solo for that that ended up on my first record, and I finished it with the Beat It solo. So um, next thing I knew, I got a call that he was interested, and it was a matter of coming down and playing with the band and seeing how it went. And they never actually told me I had the gig. It's just, I never got sent home. <laughs> <laughs> what was the location? Where did you go to? audition with the band? Uh, Leeds. Uh, Leeds. Rehearsal studio. I think that was the place. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So they just, they never told you to go home, but yeah. no one said you're hired? Yeah. It was really it took weird. took a while before they said, okay, you got to sign this contract and yeah. join up? Yeah. I mean, imagine a production of that size. There's a hundred people in the entourage that moves from city to city. So there's a bazillion details to deal with. And they probably thought, well, bands doing their thing and Michael would see videos of us and eventually I had a passport and a ticket to Tokyo. Well tell us about your, your first bonding experience with Michael when, when you really felt like you were a true member of the family and, and you were looking at him as a person as opposed to the icon. Um, well it, at the first rehearsals there was always some downtime when they were, you know, we did the band by ourselves for months, singers, dancers by themselves. And the second month was with Michael in a big production studio, or hall, one of the places they shoot TV shows. Mm -hmm. So you could do all the pyrotechnics and explosions and all the special effects. And there was always downtime then, and we got to hang out and talk. He was very down to earth, very approachable at that time. But the, kind of the turning point in my confidence was we were in Tokyo and he shut down the Tokyo Disneyland mm -hmm. and uh, I was I was with Cheryl Crow, she was a background singer and we were looking at this Daffy Duck toothbrush holder <laughs> in the shop 
And I was just fascinated with it because you push Daffy's head down and the eyes would go back and forth for as long as you're supposed to brush your teeth. And I didn't know he was anywhere near me. And he came up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, I really like how you're playing the beat at solo. And I thought, job security, awesome. <laughs> wow. And tell us about the first experience when you walked out on stage and the crowd erupted. Yeah. And the surreal moment, like, this is, this is for real. Yeah. Well, I, I remember more the, the anxiety of that day, not knowing if I would be nervous or if my hands would be shaking. Because mm -hmm. I had so many instances where that did happen mm -hmm. in the past, where I was nowhere near as rehearsed as I was with Michael. You know, you, you think you got it down, you're playing it great, no mistakes, you get on the stage, it's like, ah. Um, but thankfully, when I got on the stage with him, it was no nerves at all. It was just so well rehearsed that it was just about performing and having fun. Mm -hmm. And what are, what are your greatest memories? Obviously, there were amazing shows and audiences, but when you look back, what were the highlights? What were the absolute cream of mm. those? Well, um, the Super Bowl stood out because it was so much fun, and it was a one-of-a-kind thing that would never happen again. <laughs> um, and going out to so many people. Uh, and I remember Irvine Meadows really well because the sound was the best in the world. Something about the way that thing is built and how the sound comes back to you it was really nice. <laughs> I wish every stadium was like that, you know. But um, gosh, and the Tokyo Disneyland, you know, <laughs> that was the ultimate of being spoiled. And I could never stand in lines after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Michael means so much to all of us. I was telling Carlo, I was born the same month as Michael, so growing up, being in music, I always considered a kindred spirit, you know, mm. and, um, you know, us Virgos got to stick together, yeah. but um, besides the great music, what do you hope that people keep in their heart of, from, from Michael, you know, for the future? Ah, that he was such a giver. I mean, people mm. weren't aware of how much of his time he gave. Wherever we would go, he'd go to hospitals to visit sick kids. You know, a lot of, I mean, it's hard when you're on the road to, to take time out and do anything, to go to your hotel and do your show and go on to the next place. But he would take the time to do that, which was awesome. And he, he gave away so much of his money to charities. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was a very kind soul. Mm -hmm. And all that you've been through and you've seen, what advice would you give to that young guitarist or entertainer coming up today? It's a completely different world. Yeah. But what do they need to concentrate on or avoid, not worry about, to really have a, a chance or have any kind of lasting identity? Well, number one is to maintain your love of music. Because that's what the audience feels. You know, mm -hmm. if you're over it and you're just going through the motions, the audience feels that. You know, if you're not having fun on stage, get off the stage, basically. So, um, a lot of people pick up the guitar or any instrument for one reason or another, um, but if you pick it up because you want to be famous, that's, that's a bad start. Fame just happens if it happens. You know, I mean, you can do things to pursue it, but it's a crapshoot. So you might as well get most of your satisfaction from your music.